Okay. Hi, hi, Paranjoy. So we are Hello, here. To, so we are here to discuss media matters, and it sure does in every which way. Uh, so you know, it'll be just like a conversation. But I was just thinking just before we sort of connected that uh, arrests. You know, so many people are being arrested. Journalists, their FIRs being filed against many of them, including our friend Vinod Dua. And you have had a lot of journalists being thrown out of jobs in the hundreds, maybe thousands. There doesn't seem to be a figure for it. So what has brought us to this pass? I mean, why is this happening to us today? Okay, there are, there are two issues and let me deal with them one by one. Journalists getting harassed. Why are they being harassed? That's one part of uh, what I want to, to, want to talk about. Yeah. And the other problem is journalists being thrown out of their jobs or being asked to take deep salary cuts. Yeah. Now, uh, let me deal with this part of the subject first. Seema, I've been a journalist now for more than 43 years. Never have I seen this kind of a bloodbath in the media. To some extent, not entirely, to some extent it is a reflection of what is happening in other parts of the world. For several years now, for well over a decade, we've seen how advertising revenue to mainstream media organizations have either been coming down or they've been stagnant or in a, case, or in a country like India, hardly growing. But this period has also coincided with the period when the internet has expanded at an exponential rate. And, and that handset that you have in your hand is, is your newspaper, your magazine, your radio station, your Absolutely. television, your, and, and much more, and much more. So the whole issue is if people don't risk, want journalists, writers, photographers, videographers, dancers, singers, musicians to have intellectual property rights, they want everything free. If that is the case, if a, if, if a journalist, she or he doesn't deserve a decent income, then you're going to get trashed. And this is exactly what we're get, getting. The, 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 the digital world is filled with fake, false information. Absolutely. Disinformation, misinformation that's going on. So when you look at this is happening across the world. I mean, I'm just to give you two sets of statistics. In India, in most parts of India, there are more SIMs, S-I-M, subscriber identity modules than human beings. Mm -hmm. We have a country with 135 uh, and, and, and uh, crore people. And, and you have about 115 or 116 SIM crore SIMs. Now, on top of that, you have the widespread use of the social media. You have 90 crore voters and you have 40 crore people who are using WhatsApp. WhatsApp. So this, this is just to give you how much the digital social media has become a part of India today. Now, what is happening is this has resulted in large, I mean, a complete change in the way people are consuming information. And what has happened in India is that much of the mainstream media, which was dependent on advertising, especially after COVID, when advertising revenues have shrunk, they become even more dependent on government advertising. That also explains why such a large section of the media is so subservient to the government. Yes. So this is one reason why we see what is happening in the media. Now, I, I dare say that even profitable media organizations, they are throwing people out of jobs. Journalists are being asked to take deep salary cuts and expenditure on reportage, on, re on, on research, on investigation are completely shut. And this has had a huge impact on the quality of what you read, what you hear, what you watch. And you add to that the point that you made earlier, you have a majoritarian regime in power, which is extremely not just intolerant of dissenting voices, but also 
vindictive. So the administration has been using every trick in the trade, so to say, the use of the law, the misuse of the law, the Indian Penal Code, the Code of Criminal Procedure, uh, the laws on defamation, and not just that. The, you're using even the UAPA, the, the, unla the Unlawful yeah. uh, Activity uh, uh, Prevention Act, to harass journalists, journalists in smaller towns and, 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 and in, uh, who are out of the metro areas, they are uh, more vulnerable. But it has been recorded that since the end of March, since the lockdown was imposed on, on, on the night of the 24th and the 25th of March, at least 60 journalists across India have been harassed, intimidated, and, and this has had a chilling effect on others, saying, don't write anything critical of whoever's in power, whoever's holding positions of power. So if the marker of a democracy as is that the marker of the fourth, fourth estate is that the journalist should ask difficult questions to whoever is in power. That role is not being fulfilled by the media in India. They've become part of an advertising agency, part of a public relations network. This is what a very large section of the Indian media has degenerated to. I would say never since the mid-70s, since the emergency, has such a large section of the media in India become so subservient to our ruling our rulers and, there's, and no this need, is, there's no need for it i mean except for the money angle that you've talked about that you know um, income has uh, dipped and revenues have gone down there's no need for it there is some level of apart from the money aspect there is also a certain cowardliness and a desire to live very close and proximity to power right so it's a lot more than that as well. It's something coming from fundamentally our innards, as it were. No. Yes and no, Seema. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I think salaries matter, especially now when there's an economic uh, depression on. If people have to, you know, keep the home fires burning, ensure their children are educated, then yeah, yes, you need the money. Of course. Everybody there's no doubt about yeah. that. But what we see is even owners and those who are in charge of the media, they are extremely cowardly. Even during the emergency, you had the Indian Express, you had the Statesman, you had Himmat, you, you had other publications who were willing to play the role of the fourth estate, to hold accountable those who are in positions of power and authority. You see, the difference between the emergency and today is what um, the former uh, bureaucrat and uh, Indian Army officer M.G. Devasahayam says, mm. at that time, it was a jhatka. You suddenly put everybody behind bars. What is happening now is a kind of a halal, a slow bleeding, a slow squeeze that has been happening over the last six years and a little longer. So yes, journalists are being bludgeoned into sub submission. They're, 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 those, those who employ them, those, those who pay them salaries, they are themselves uh, very worried because the law is being misused against the critics of the government, whether it be the income tax department, whether it be the enforcement directorate, whether it be the CBI, whether it be other law enforcing agencies, the police force, the, the police department. All of these are being used. The laws of the land are being misused to harass journalists. And I'll, I'll give you one other example. Sima, on the 31st of March, what happened in the Supreme Court? You had the Home Secretary, Mr. Ajay Bhalla. You had the Solicitor General of India, Mr. Tushar Mehta, claiming in writing to the highest court of the land that there's not a single migrant worker on a highway. Now, there couldn't be a bigger lie than that. Now, who is to call out the government's lies? On that, that, on that same occasion, the government wanted the Supreme Court to sort of issue a diktat saying journalists can't report on what's happening on the, on the healthcare situation unless they get the official version. But then the Supreme Court didn't go along with the government and said, no, we must allow free discussion. But what do you do if the government is not telling you about what, is, what the reality on the ground is, or whether there's a shortage of personal protection equipment? And, and a whole lot of things are happening. You know, the, the emergency laws 
are being misused. There are people who are profiteering from the miseries of the, the patients, of COVID patients. We are seeing this, I mean, we are seeing actually the worst of Indian society. And, and we're, not, we're not bringing out anything. We're just not being able to report it at any level. Um, yeah, before I, I'm going to catch you in this short conversation on a solution, but before that, you know, this nationalism and the media, this is something I think the media um, has gone through continuously. It's not just today. Um, even whenever there's been a war, I remember our elders and our editors telling us on how they were asked to be nationalist in 62, in 65, in 71, and now. So everything with the army and the government, which they do both inextricably come together, and then in the name of nationalism, the media is targeted or pilloried or told to shut up or to not raise even uncomfortable questions. So how do we draw a line there and where do we go from there? Because this is something I find even young reporters or even new people who are joining journalism today are not able to make out that difference. Siva, you know, uh, it's not just nationalism. It is actually the, the worst form of jingoism. Where you're, you are being judged by your loyalty to whoever's in power. And it's not just the army. You know, there have been reporters who have been reporting on Ladakh. And when you report the truth, you become anti-national. When your sources on the ground tell you something is happening and you faithfully report it, when satellite images tell you something and you faithfully write about it and report about it and speak about it, you are you are branded as a traitor. You know, and, and I mentioned all the laws that are being used, and among the laws that are being misused is the law of sedition. Yeah. I mean, that is a colonial era act which doesn't deserve to be on our statute books. So the equation of those who are criticizing, those who are asking questions with being anti-national, with being traitors, this has reached a new height. It was always there, but today it's reached a new height. And you know, this inability to you know, accept that it's the job of a journalist to ask questions, to ask tough questions, to ask difficult questions, not goody-goody ones. I mean, I mean, look at our prime minister, Mr. Narendra Modi. I dare say that he's the first prime minister of this country who has never, since he became prime minister, has never faced an, a, a media conference which is unscripted, which is spontaneous, where any journalist can ask him any questions. He has picked and chosen journalists to whom he's given interviews to. They've asked him questions that he wanted asked. They've not asked him follow-up questions. They've not followed up on his responses to issues like demonetization, and Mr. Modi has even given long interviews to a Canadian citizen who is an Indian actor who ends up asking him questions like, you know, about the mangoes he likes and the way he eats mangoes. I mean, so this is the first time that we are seeing when the Prime Minister of India, I mean, it also shows what he thinks of the media, what he thinks of the right to free expression. And, and I, I, it is most unfortunate that even uh, when he, uh, when the Bharatiya Janata Party returned to power in May 2019, and Mr. Modi was sitting next to Mr. Amit Shah, Home Minister, he didn't answer any of the questions. Mr. Amit Shah answered the questions. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really very, very sorry and sad to say this. Before he became Prime Minister, he would answer questions. He would have press conference, but this is also infrequent. But today, is Mr. Modi saying, everything I say to the media has to be one-way communication, man ki baat, that questions can't be asked of him. Then, then what does the media do? What does the fourth estate do? How does it hold truth to power? What is its role? Do we call ourselves a democracy under such circumstances? And that too, the world's largest democracy? True. I think this has been a continuous chipping away, you know? It's become pretty drastic. It's very obvious. It's authoritarian. It's a sort of shoot the messenger message. But it's 
been a chipping away at the block through successive governments and somehow we've been at it you know like even in the earlier government when the congress which is supposedly for more for democracy uh, than other parties or at least definitely more than the bjp uh, was not allowing uh, had the same scripted uh, kind of press conferences whenever there was a visiting dignitary and were the ones who actually introduced that the favorites would get the questions and the others who could ask a awkward question would be weeded out by the MEA or by the Home Ministry spokespersons. So this is something which kept creeping up on us and we never set the ground rules and we never protested. So it has also coincided with the changing nature of journalism and the control of the corporates over us, isn't it? Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Uh, what you're saying, I completely agree with you. In the past too, it's happened. You know, nobody likes criticism. Nobody likes to be pointed out, yeah, these are your errors, this is what you shouldn't have done. No individual likes it. No government. No, government. Like it. Yeah. no likes it. Okay, so we, we may say we, we, we can't distinguish between constructive criticism and, and not so constructive criticism. But the point is, never before has there been so much disdain for the media as we see it. Yes, past governments also didn't wanted to control the media. Or, uh, you know, would give had had their little favorites who would be their lap dogs and who would you know sort of re reproduce their handouts. But but the sheer brazenness with which this is happening is something new. You know, just as in the past too, there were rumors, there was there was there was fake news, there was disinformation. But technology has reached a stage where the sheer scale and the sheer speed at which disinformation is disseminated is unprecedented. And the last point that you made about the corporatization. Yes, there was always corporatization of the media, you know, from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's time you, and Krishna Menon's time, you talked about the jute and the steel media. Uh, you had subsequently the media after making money from the media. I mean, the media owners of the media, they would uh, sort of... Uh, diversify into everything from coal mining to real estate. The difference is today that, again, in terms of scale, say the richest man uh, in absolutely. India, I, I mean, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, is a media baron. He's yeah. also is today running uh, India's largest mobile telecommunications and internet data service provider. So the content distributor, the content creator, you know, there's, there's a sort of a convergence of it. So we see this happening uh, on a scale that has been, we've never seen before. Yes, we saw bits and pieces of it earlier, but today we've moved to a completely new level. True, absolutely. And I think in progressive uh, terms, this was going to happen. And of course, if you have a more authoritarian government, you get worse and worse and worse. Uh, you know, if you look at America as to what's happening there now and just this fight back for democracy, for equality, for justice, and it's actually being led by the media. It's not, um, uh, you know, and it's because of that you are getting a very close scrutiny of Trump and everything he says or doesn't say. If you come back to us, tomorrow if the government changes, do you think that any government that comes to power will restore journalism to a fairly pure kind of format that we are seeing maybe at the CNN or something like that in the US? Or do you think that every government would like to continue with this kind of control because it makes them easier, it makes it easier for them, makes them happier? And two, what can we do in terms of something like Fifth Amendment or certain laws which now protect us from government uh, misadventures or exploitation? Uh, these are not easy questions to answer uh, because what is happening today, Siva, is if you were to compare the U.S. with India, there are similarities and differences. Historically, there have been similarities and differences. Whether it be the New York Times or Washington Post, typically they've been run by individuals who have safeguarded and protected the independence of the journalists. There have been that, that classic Chinese wall between the owners and those who actually were in charge of what is put out editorially. Having said that, let's also look at the fact that in India, we don't have those kinds of big institutions. Today, there's a huge debate on how to monetize 
the content that you put out on the net. Uh, maybe New York Times has done it better than the others. Uh, Australia uh, has been very, very hard against Google and Facebook because we are not just looking at the traditional media, we are looking at the digital monopolies yeah. who have a huge role to play in what you watch, what you hear, and what you see. I'll give you one, one bit of uh, a, a bit of statistics. I mean, just the two large organizations, Alphabet, which includes Google and all its uh, different versions, Google, YouTube, and the application, which is the Android operating system on your mobile phone. And you add to that Facebook, which includes WhatsApp, and alphabet and between these two large digital con conglomerates they account for well over 80 percent some would say well over 90 percent of all the information that is moving and traversing of the over the internet at any given point of time outside the people's republic of china now having said this let's see how do we go, go ahead from here see one way is that I think we're not going to be the same again. The media is not going to be the same again. Post-COVID, the world is not going to be the same. You and I are not going to be the same, and nor, nor is the media. But I think the case for people or subscribers paying for content has become stronger than before. The case for not-for-profit not organizations, uh, philanthropic organizations giving grants to sustain journalism, is become stronger than ever before. The, the need for crowdfunding media organizations has become very, very strong. So if the old advertising driven revenue model of mainstream media is broken and will never perhaps be repaired, we look at new ways forward. When you look at the US, yes, journalists are, uh, have been able to criticize Trump, which they, ha which they haven't. I mean, Trump at least meets journalists. Even if he says that everything the New York Times puts out and CNN puts out is all fake, he still meets journalists, even if it's for short occasions. Yeah, yeah, even if he, yeah. I mean, I mean he, he behaves atrociously, of course. Yeah, of course. But <laughs> we have a prime minister who doesn't even meet the media, unless everything is controlled. So, so that's the difference. But, but I also think that, you know, uh, we'll wait and watch what happens uh, in uh, the next four months. Uh, in, in November, we will know uh, whether Trump will get a second term as the president of the U.S. But, but Mr. Modi is here uh, for quite some time, and uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and watch what happens for in the coming three and a half years and longer. The, the short point is, I think the Indian media is right now going through a kind of crisis, which you and I as journalists... We are the we are the oldies. We are the senior guys. We 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 we've seen the transition from Gutenberg's printing press to the iPhone. But I think the kind of crisis that we are facing is unprecedented. The crisis where opinion takes precedence over fact, where fake takes precedence over credible information, where the role of the owner is far more important than that of the editor. So these kinds of things that have happened uh, are in more ways than one, not at all good for ensuring the right to free expression, which is a fundamental right of every Indian citizen under Article 19.1a. And, and the manner in which, and I go back to where I started, the way journalists are being harassed, the way they're being intimidated, the way in which laws are being misused, all of it does not portend well for the near-term future of the media in this country. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Paranjoy. I think uh, though we try to keep it short so that keeping in time, uh, keeping in mind the attention span of the viewers, we've covered a lot and this was amazing. Thank you. And I'm going to keep coming back to you on various media matters as we continue our journey. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you so much, Seema, for speaking with me. Bye. Keep well. Yeah.